The good dudes grow 2.0. All right, everybody, welcome back to Good Dudes Grow. And like I said in the intro, I am excited about this because I heard this great doctor speak at the Psychedelic and Cannabis Summit a couple of weeks ago. And she blew my mind uh, on the microdosing and the research she was doing. So I said, you know what? I got to get her on my show. So I'd like to thank Dr. Olga Chernolas to my show. Ms. Chernolas, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And it's wonderful to join you and your listeners today. Wonderful. So give us a little background how you got started in the psychedelic industry, because I know you probably didn't grow up and says, you know what, I'm going to start dealing with magic mushrooms and, and that's what I'm going to do for my life. So how did you get started in all of it? I've actually was close enough to this. I, I have a degree in neuropsychopharmacology and that's, I guess, exactly what magic mushrooms are, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm a pharmacist and neuroscientist by training and going through my doctorate training, I was very privileged and fortunate to be working out of a uh, teaching mental health hospital. So I would just take my lab coat off, wash my hands, uh, put my rat friends away and walk down one flight of stairs to go see um, our patients. The patients we were seeing at our unit were treatment resistant, depressed people who had you know, years of their lives robbed away from them uh, by, by the disease and it was it was a very humbling experience for me to get to see why I was doing the research that I was doing. And it just, you know, puts you in a state of thinking what else can be done for these people because it's uh, it's very painful to see their misery. Right. And I noticed we're seeing a huge uptick uh, on articles and stuff coming out about the psychedelic industry. How has it changed over the last five years or how when you got started involved? Absolutely. So I've jumped into psychedelics from cannabis. I was working in cannabis for a number of years when I started seeing the research articles from these very reputable international research institutions showing incredible mind-blowing data on potential efficacy of these substances for treatment of some of mental health conditions uh, which we're not very well equipped to treat now so when i saw that i was like man i i gotta be a part of this and uh when you want something it comes around and i guess i wasn't the only person seeing this um, incredible evidence um five years ago there wasn't psychedelic industry there was compass and that's pretty much it and there was research groups uh, working around the world on trying to put out the the evidence and the data to show how uh incredible the potential of these uh drugs are and now several years later we have companies going public we have um huge interest um, in this area and uh, I guess in part it's being spurred by the COVID and the uh, mental health um, problems being exacerbated by us all being locked away so it's it's a great time to be alive. I, I kind of got started the same way. I started researching the uh, the effects of cannabis and CBD on mental health for first responders as being a first responder. And there's, it's always interesting how when you start talking to people about plant-based medicine, they go straight to all the stuff they were doing when they were young. Like, you know, I remember those days when I was smoking, you know, smoking weed and everything else. And it's come such a long way that what is the biggest misconceptions people have around psychedelics? Is it the same thing as they had with cannabis? It's like, are they, when you mention, okay, we're going to do a test on MDMA or ecstasy, people sit back and go, whoa, wait a minute. I remember that drug when I was young. We're going to, it's good for yeah. you now. So I think to me, there are two very different uh, misconceptions that we have uh, about these drugs. So first one is that they're, bad, they're narcotics, they're banned substances. So there is absolutely no scientific medicinal evidence for these substances being banished and not being accessible um, to doctors who are just looking for, for more options to treat their patients and to give them better health outcomes, right? So that's, that's the first one. And the other one, and I'm probably not going to get uh, many... Um, Fans from your listeners for saying this, but I'm not loving the cure-all talk that we now 
having migrating from cannabis to psychedelics. It's not a miracle drug. It's, it seems to be very, very, very promising. But is it for everybody? Is it gonna make us all better? No, I, as, as a pharmacist, I don't believe that there is such a thing out there that's good for all of us. Right. Maybe water, but if you have too much too quick, that will kill you as well. So. Right. And that's what I tell everybody, even to those who are interested in trying it, it's not one pill and then next thing you know, you're cured. There is, there's a roadmap to do. There's other things you got to do with it to actually make sure that th these things actually work for you. You actually, I, like your bio, I said you work for the, uh, the Wake Network. Explain to my listeners exactly what the Wake Network is. Absolutely. So uh, Wake Network is a Canadian company uh, aiming to uncover the therapeutic potential of psychedelic substances. We are vertically integrated. We have, we're producing our mushrooms. We have a facility in Jamaica where we grow psychedelic mushrooms. We then process them in GMP conditions, make the study drug out of them, put that study drug into clinical trials, research it, and once we have enough data about it, we're hoping to, to put it into clinics, our own or somebody else's, and just do good by people. And, and with that clinical trials, you got some big news, I think a couple of weeks ago, that you guys actually got a, a special clinical trial coming up. I think you just mentioned it kind of like in Jamaica, is that correct? Yes, it's gonna be a microdosing clinical trial. And you'd be amazed. I mean, microdosing is, is a buzzword today, but with psilocybin, there is zero, zero clinical trials right now looking at its effects. So we are taking up this challenge. We are walking the talk so that we can create this evidence for ourselves, for the community, for the medical community, for the industry, for patients. So I'm, I couldn't be more excited about this. And you gave a speech, like I said, at the Psychedelic Cannabis Research Summit on microdosing. Can you mm -hmm. tell my listeners, not the full length, but kind of like give the cliff notes on exactly what microdosing is and what it can and possibly do and what your clinical trials are looking for? Absolutely. So uh, microdosing, you know, you'll, you'll ask four people and you'll get, uh, get five different answers. So in, uh, in short, it's taking psychoactive substances in the amount so small that you don't feel impaired. So, um, and somebody will tell you that if you're not feeling nothing, nothing, then it's probably not enough. But my thinking is you shouldn't be feeling any impairment, but the effects, uh, the purported positive effects on health and general well-being should transpire. Um, when people microdose, people typically microdose with either psilocybin or LSD, but you know, anything you can think of, people microdose with. It's DMT, it's ketamine, it's mescaline, anything literally you can think of. Um, when people microdose, typically they take about 2 to 10% of the dose that they would take for the full experience. And with microdosing uh, true psychedelics, uh, things like um, psilocybin and LSD, people report that their mood improves, uh, that they get more creative, that they function better um, in their family, in their community, in social uh, situations in general. Um, they feel more connected to self, others, and nature. So it's just a short num short list of things that people who microdose report to experience from this practice. And on the study of microdosing, have you found any changes in, I know you're still doing clinical trials, but in like in PTSD, depression, and other items? Because I know you gave a little bit of that information during your... your... Mm -hmm. um, again, going back to virtual lack of data around efficacy or potential efficacy of microdosing for these conditions? The short answer is we don't know. The long and better answer is people suffering from depression, people suffering from anxiety, people suffering from addictions, people suffering from trauma, both uh, brain trauma and psychological trauma, do report that 
they feel better when they use psychedelics either full dose or when they microdose with them. Interesting. And, and your, your study in Jamaica is doing it on natural psilocybin compared to the synthetic, correct? Is there a difference between the both of them? Uh, it's hard to tell if there is a difference be between the both of them. Possibly there is, and we need to look into it deeper. So what's been done so far, all of the trials with psilocybin. So number one, all of them were done for full dose scenario. And number two, all of them were done with synthetic substance. And the reason why they have been done with synthetic substance is you can imagine how many hoops researchers need to jump through to be allowed to research these substances, which are now schedule one, you know, it's, it has no value in eyes of regulators. So it's very difficult to get to work with them. So for researchers trying to advance this field, they had to access what the regulator would okay. And for FDA, it's much easier to sign under something that meets their very specific list of regulations rather than going for natural substance that everybody, virtually everybody who's using psilocybin is using it in the natural form. So for me, it's us producing and registering our drug for our microdose trial and with it being natural drug, I couldn't be uh, more excited that number one, we get to put it into microdose clinical trial. And number two, it's the actual thing that people are using when they report these benefits because nobody gets access to synthetic psilocybin outside of the research scenario. And what people do do when they microdose is they take their mushrooms and take them either ground up or just mushroom form. And that's, that's what we're going to test. So that's going to be a, quite a, an interesting test for you, like, kind of like basically groundbreaking new territory for you for, for your clinical trials, correct? Absolutely. And this, this drug is world's first legal microdose because, you know, there are jurisdictions where psychedelics are, I wouldn't go um, to the lengths of saying that they're illegal, but they're not illegal through one uh, system or another. So our drug that we have uh, registered with Jamaican Ministry of Health is actually world's first legal microdose. That is that is fabulous. Congratulations. If people wanted to follow you and Wake's progress on this type of research and any every all the other type of research you're doing, how could they do that? Uh, Wake is at wake.net. Um, and I can be found at Olga Chernilaz on LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever you can, wherever you can find, I'm there. Perfect. I'll put those, those notes in the, those, those links in the show notes. Dr. Chernilaz, I appreciate you coming. It's basically all the information I wanted to get my, my viewers and I wanted them actually to know who you are so they could actually follow you and get more information. So I appreciate it. That was great. I was, uh, I had such a great time with you uh, here today. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have yourself a wonderful weekend. Same your way. Bye. Take good care. Bye. Good Dunes Grow 2.0. Thank you for tuning in. If you're still listening to this, that means you gained something out of this episode. So make sure you share it with a friend, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode of The Good Dunes Grow 2.0.